We now have a rather special guest because it's not every day that we have a British lord coming to our studios. But I'm honoured to say that for today's Touch Basins Hall, we're joined by Lord Alf Dubbs. Lord Dubbs is a British politician who served as a member of Parliament and has spent much of his life fighting for the rights of refugees. That drive comes in part from his own personal experiences as a child refugee fleeing to Britain as Nazi Germany closed in on his native Czechoslovakia. Lord Dubbs, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So I hope you're having a good time in Korea. I hope you've been here a couple of times before. I have been here before, but I'm having a good time. But I'm, I'm at a conference, so I haven't seen as much of the country. I hope to see more of the city anyway tomorrow. Right, yes, and Seoul has lots to offer for you to see. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Let's get into your story now, because I gave a very brief introduction that you came to Britain as a child, mm. uh, escaping from Czechoslovakia as Nazi closed in on the country. But uh, it's not quite as simple as that, is it? You are one of thousands of children from all over Europe that were brought to the UK as part of a programme called the Kinder Transport Rescue Operation. For our listeners who might not know, can you tell us more about the Kinder Transport and how you came to the UK? Most of the Kinder Transport brought children from either Germany, Austria or Czechoslovakia. And I, uh, I was in Prague. Uh, I was six years old. Uh, my father was Jewish and my mother wasn't. <coughs> so my father left Prague immediately. The Nazis occupied in March 1939, several months before the war started. My mother was refused permission to leave, and she put me on a kinder transport. I remember various things happening. For example, uh, my school book had a picture of the Czech president, mm. President Benish. We had to tear that out and stick in a picture of Hitler. And there were German soldiers everywhere. So one's memory is not that good, but mm. there are certain things that stick out very clearly. Mm. Uh, and so I remember that and the German soldiers everywhere and so on. And then I remember uh, the, the parting of my, mo my mother and a lot of parents were seeing us off on the train. It took two days crossing Germany and Holland, and then we got to Liverpool Street Station in London. So this kinder transport uh, operation, this was a, a hugely ambitious uh, an incredible kind of uh, project that the British government undertook, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't the British government. For example, I can tell you more about the one from Prague. It was because of one man and the people who helped him, a man called Nicky Winton, who died a couple of years ago, aged 106. And he saw what was happening in Czechoslovakia. He saw mainly Jewish children uh, in danger, well, Jewish people in danger, and he decided something had to be done. And he had to persuade the British authorities to allow children in, mm. He had to deal with the suspicious Germans who were wondering what he was up to, and he did it all by sheer effort of will. Other people might have walked away, but he said, no, I've got to do something, and he did it. So I owe my life to him. And there were similar uh, operations in, in other countries, but it wasn't the British government. It was almost despite the British government, except I would say this, that the British government, Britain was the only country that took the kinder transport children. Even the Americans said it's extra to quota. So they only came to Britain, and 10,000 altogether came before the war started. So then what happened to you when you came to Britain? Were you given a British citizenship as a refugee or what happened there? More complicated than that, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. My father was here, so I was lucky. I think most of them did not have a parent waiting for them at, at Liverpool Street Station. My mother, having been refused permission to leave, is quite a long story, she eventually did manage to escape and got to London the day before the war started. So t so to that extent, I was fortunate. My father then died not long afterwards, so it was just my mother and me. And of course, I spoke Czech and German. I had to learn English and things like that had, uh, I had to overcome. So it was an interesting experience. But at the age of six, one learns languages quickly. Mm. The school playground is a tough place. And to survive in it, you have to learn the language. Mm. Then, uh, so you grew up the rest of your life in the UK, and then you ended up becoming involved in politics. You became an MP. Did your experiences as uh, a child refugee shape uh, your life into politics? Or was that what led you to a career in politics? Well, I don't want to seem as if I had the wisdom of Einstein. Uh, <laughs> look, looking back, it's easy to make myself mm. a fantastic individual. I wasn't. Uh, I'm not. But um, no, I was passionately interested in politics. I think from an early age, when my contemporaries were not that interested. I think it's because I was trying to understand why what had happened to me had happened. Mm. And in puzzling that one out, I came to the conclusion, I think, 
that if evil men can do so much harm in politics, maybe politics could also be used to change the process for the better. Mm. So I always thought politics was interesting, but I never thought as a refugee from Central Europe in Britain that I would ever aspire to anything uh, as elevated as getting into Parliament. Mm. And my ambition was to become a local councillor, and that was a very satisfying thing to do for some years before I managed to get into the House of Commons. Right, and then you were also given a life peerage. Uh, uh, well, it's more complicated than that. I then, after two terms in the House of Commons, I lost my seat. It's called democracy. <laughs> and um, and then I was, for, for, um, for some years, I was head of an NGO, the Refugee Council. And then I was put in the House of Lords. I had to stop being uh, head of an NGO then. Mm. I was put in the House of Lords. But I was obviously always interested in, in refugees and discrimination and minorities and so on because I was one myself. So I was more interested than other people would have been. Although I think uh, the argument on behalf of child refugees should not depend entirely upon the background of the individual who's, mm. who's, who's advocating the policy. Uh, but obviously I was emotionally involved. But the other thing that helped me was that because I came to Britain as an unaccompanied child refugee, the British government found it harder to criticise the idea of unaccompanied child refugees simply because it would have sounded as if they were being personally critical of me. Mm. So it was helpful politically. <laughs> so in your efforts to help uh, refugees and specifically child refugees, you've uh, launched, you launched a government scheme to your name in 2016 called the Dubs Amendment. That's bringing child refugees from the European migrant crisis into Britain. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, first of all, let me be clear. I never called it by my name, uh, <laughs> uh, but but the media called it by my name. Right. So that's yeah. how it happened. Well, the position was this, that there was a bill going through Parliament. It got to the House of Lords. All legislation in Britain has to go through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, the bill got to us. And we heard at that time that there were estimated to be 95,000 unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe. And Interpol, the international police body, estimated that 10,000 had disappeared. Shocking figures. Shocking there were so many. Wow. Living where, in, where'd they go? Well, that's the problem. They, they were vulnerable to criminality, to trafficking, to prostitution, all sorts of things. So we don't know. They just disappeared. Uh, maybe some were found later. But I put down an amendment saying Britain should take some of them. I never said we should take them all, but mm. we should take some. They were particularly the ones in, in, in northern France, in Greece, and in Italy. And, and, the, uh, and my amendment was intended to take some of those. Mm. And after much um, some conversations with Theresa May, who was then the Home Secretary, uh, eventually um, public opinion, what, what happened was it, it passed in the Lords very easily. It was defeated in the Commons slightly. <laughs> they went back to the Lords, and then something remarkable happened. Public opinion suddenly woke up to this. Mm. I think partly because there were terrible pictures of people drowning in the Mediterranean. Right, there was a little that. little Syrian boy called Alan Kurdi who was found drowned on the Mediterranean be beach. And I think that, that woke British public opinion up, mm. and that put pressure on um, on all the politicians. We always made the campaign for child refugees across party. We didn't want to be one party only, although I'm a Labour politician. Uh, we wanted to be across party because we thought we had a better chance of success that way. So public opinion then had an influence on um, um, some of the Conservative MPs who were hesitant. And eventually Theresa May summoned me in again and said the government proposed to accept the amendment. So originally, though, the scheme was for, understand, for 3,000 children to be brought in, but then that number didn't end up not being that number. Well, it, 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 look, can I go back a stage? Sure, sure. There are actually two, two uh, sorts of children in Europe, refugee children. There are the ones who have no relatives in, in, in Britain, and they're the ones my amendment was intended to help. Mm. In addition, there is a European-wide treaty called the Dublin Treaty, and under part of that there is provision for a child in one EU country to join relatives, family in another, okay? Now, on my scheme, the original figure was 3,000. For parliamentary technical reasons, which I'm sure your listeners will be, bo <laughs> will be bored with, we had to drop the number. Mm. It's mainly because it involves expenditure and mm. the House of Lords shouldn't, involve, shouldn't, shouldn't pass amendments unless the government's happy about expenditure. Anyway, um, so we had to drop the 3,000 figure, so we did not have a precise figure. Quite arbitrarily, the government said that they'll, they'll cap it at 480. These are tiny, tiny figures when you think about it, tiny figures. Although 
even one child coming to safety is, is a victory for humanity. So mm. we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't knock it as being uh, totally hopeless. But they said 480 because they said there are not enough local authorities in, in, the, in the UK who are willing to find foster parents who will look after the children. Mm. Okay? And so they said 480, and we've challenged that because we know there are more local authorities who will do it. But um, so we've got several thousand. So the position is that, uh, that they've only taken about 220 out of the 480, and on the other scheme, the family union, they've only taken 800. These are very small figures. Mm. Right, we, we are quickly running out of time, but I want to ask you about this. So in, you, you found difficulty trying to get more than 450, 480 uh, child refugees into Britain, and this seems to be a growing trend. More and more countries seem to be closing their borders with domestic concerns taking precedence. Do you sympathize with these concerns? And what would you say to these people who might question you know, why these uh, uh, refugees need to come to their country? I understand, I understand the difficulty. Uh, I believe, however, that if one puts the argument to people in Britain that we're talking about children who are sleeping rough under trees in Calais, who are in terrible conditions of vulnerability on the Greek islands where, where the situation is appalling, there are sexual assaults on children at night, uh, uh, they're liable to be trafficked, all sorts of criminality li is liable to be forced on them. Uh, so I think we have to look at it in terms of what the need is. And I think on the whole, British public opinion is quite sympathetic. However, there is a resistance to refugees and migrants. They're the other, they're different people. And unfortunately in Europe, the extreme right-wing political parties have exploited the situation to gain votes. And Angela Merkel, who was very good in Germany, uh, she had an electoral setback uh, with the right-wing party, and similarly in Hungary, in Italy, uh, Austria, and so on. So the situation is difficult politically, and that's why I say we, we've got to keep public opinion on our side if we're going to achieve bringing over uh, more child refugees. You also understand have made comments about how Brexit could affect these uh, implications as well. How, how we should be you're saying we should be bringing more refugees uh, to you know UK and other countries, but with Brexit, especially for UK, that could cause obstacles. Well, first of all, let me be clear. I think Brexit is a terrible disaster. We we are stupid as a country, and it's awful in every possible way. However, to get to your question, to get to get to your question. Um, my amendment does not depend upon the Brexit situation. However, it does depend upon good cooperation between the British and French authorities and the British and the Greek authorities. So, um, so Brexit could damage that. And as regards the Dublin Treaty, that if we do not leave the EU with, 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 with an arrangement, with, with a proper, proper agreement, then we lose the provision for those children to come, the ones who've got family in Britain. Mm -hmm. However, the amendment I got through, another amendment I got through Parliament was to say that if we are staying, uh, if, we, if we're achieving a negotiated departure from the EU, some, some proper agreement, then that agreement should contain provision for us to continue to take the children for, uh, under, the, under the Dublin Treaty. So if we crash out without a deal, we've lost that as well. Mm. If anything, Lord Dubbs, you yourself are a case f to show people you know what child refugees can do and you understand you know the along with you and other uh, of the kinder transport uh, refugees that were brought to britain there have been doctors lawyers and all sorts of people understand so that's also an uh, an argument as well you wouldn't you say i think we got to be careful yes th there are people who came on the kinder transport who've made a big contribution to british life but i think the humanitarian argument should not depend upon the potential success in life mm. of child refugees i think we should take them because they need a loving home they need safety they need to be able to lead proper lives uh, but of course some of them will go on to be successful and i'm sure they'll make a good contribution i was standing in front of parliament and a syrian boy said, do you know what my ambition is? My ambition is to become a member of parliament. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fantastic. I mean, I think that's a great point to end on. Lord Dobbs, it's been an honour to have you on the show. Hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Korea and we hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you very much. I enjoyed being here.